Hi, and welcome to Concordia Online. I'm glad you've joined us today. You know, we, we want you to know that we're here for you, not just here online, right, for, for our message and worship, uh, but we're here for you to, to meet needs that you might have. And if you have needs that we can help you with, uh, please reach out to us. Send us an email at concordia um, at clcgrace.org uh, and let us know how we can help. Or we'd love to be in prayer with you, right, for any uh, concerns or, or praises that you might have. We'd love to be praying with you. So send those prayers that same email address at, to concordia at clcgrace.org. Uh, we, we also, as I said before, we're still we're doing ministry. Right? We're doing ministry out in this community. We're reaching uh, others through uh, serving of food and, and proclaiming the gospel and bringing uh, God's message. So if you want to be part of that, a lot of you uh, are. Uh, but if you want to be part of that, you can join with us by going to our website under the Giving tab. And you can give securely there on our website. You can also give securely through our text line. Uh, just text 84321 and you can give there as well. Uh, also, we have a secure mailbox at church. You can drop off your offering there or you can mail it in. Uh, we appreciate you partnering with us in this gospel work that God has given us to do. These are Certainly, these are trying times, but God is doing amazing things during this time. And we're, we're a part of that, right? God is working through us to, to bring his kingdom to bear. Uh, and this world desperately needs it. So uh, you partnering with us makes that happen. So thank you so much. You know, uh, so my name is Greg, as you know, um, and I spell my name not that unusually, but I guess it's a little unusual. I guess most people, if their name is Greg, they spell it with two G's, just one G at the end, G-R-E-G. I spell my name with three, G-R-E-G-G. -G. Uh, I've been spelling it that way, well, my whole life, right? That's the name I was given, so I know how to spell my name. I want to try something right now. I'm going to spell my name. I'm going to write it down here. I want you to do the same. If you have pen or paper handy, give it a shot. Right? I want you to write down your first name. Let's do that. All right. So there's mine. I think I got it right. All right? G-R-E-G-G. -G. Yeah, and I'm willing to bet. I'm willing to bet that you got yours right too. Right? <laughs> we know how to spell our own names. Um, I'm amazed though how many people as I correspond with them, letters or emails, and I send a bunch out and I get a bunch back, right, a ton, um, I, I'm amazed at how many people reply to me or, or send me something spelling my name wrong. And, and I don't know why that is. I don't know if they think that I don't know what I'm doing, right? So they, uh, they say, well, I'll just correct him. He doesn't know how to spell his own name. I don't know if they just don't care, right? I don't care how he spells it. I'm gonna spell it my way. Um, I don't know if they are, they're just not paying attention. It's kind of oblivious. And so they just spell it how they think it should be spelled. I don't know uh, why, they, why they don't get it right. Um, but I bring that up for this reason, right? I don't really, I mean, whatever, spell my name how you want, I guess. Um, but I bring it up for this reason, because I think that's how, as Christians, we often treat God and his word in our lives, that, that we, we see his word and we either say, well, well I don't care that's what, if that's what God says. And I think as Christians, we do this too. Well, I don't care here's what I'm gonna do, right? Or God doesn't really understand these times, so I'm gonna tweak his word to fit my lifestyle or what I want, right? Same thing with my name. Well, I don't care if that's how he spells it, I'll spell it my way. Or I think we treat God's word this way. Um, well, let me help him out a little bit, right? He doesn't quite, maybe he doesn't really know how to do this. He doesn't really, that's not really what he means. So um, let, let me tweak it for him. Or we just don't really know it. We kind of ignore it and we just kind of do what we want. Those are dangerous ways to approach God's word. Those are dangerous ways for us to live. The good news of the gospel is Jesus Christ has made us new, right? By God's grace through faith in Jesus, we are new creations now. This is what we have. This is who we are, Christ in us, us in Christ. But when we treat God's word the way often people treat my name, well, then we lead ourselves down a wrong path. We're, we're, we're not living into that new creation that Christ has won for us. We're, we're living that old way again, right? We're saying to God, well, your word doesn't matter. What, how you're calling us to live, whatever. I can rewrite that. Or we're just ignoring it entirely. And what we find ourselves doing is Paul says, we're putting on that old life again, that old way of living. And he says, don't, because you've been called to new. And so during this time of confession and absolution, I invite you uh, to confess not only the truth and the, the, uh, uh, 
the eternity, the perfectness of God's word here for all people in all times, but let's also confess our sins. Uh, and the fact that we have oftentimes willingly wandered away from God's word and not other times just kind of blithely wandered away from his word. Uh, we confess those and, and ask God to restore us, right? To get us to take off those old clothes again and, and, and remain in the new, the newness of life that Christ has given to us. Let's confess our sins now. Almighty Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is righteous, true, holy, and eternal. It's for all times and all people. And yet, Lord, even your people, even, even us as Christians, sometimes we see your word and we say, well, that's, God, let me help you out. You don't really know what you're doing. We, we kind of try to rewrite it so we can live how we want. Or we ignore it, right? We just, you know, whatever, it's there, but we'll just kind of live how we want. Right? Forgive us for that, Father. Forgive us that we, that we take your life-giving word and just treat it as if we, as if we are in charge of it. That, forgive us for our pride and our arrogance. Forgive us for how we've wandered from the truth of your word. Lord, because when we do that, it hurts us and it hurts others and it hurts the witness to your kingdom. Forgive us. And Lord, we know that you have. We know that you have in Jesus Christ. And so we ask you to restore us. Restore us by the power of your spirit that we might walk in this newness of life, that we might see your word for what it is, life-giving word, word that transforms, life that, that, that convicts, life that restores us. Help us to see it that way, Lord, and help us to live this new life. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And isn't that the good news of the gospel? That we hear in God's word that Jesus Christ has come for sinners. He's come for us and he's made us whole. He made, he's made us new. He has forgiven us our sins. So let's now walk in this new, newness of life. Let's not take God's word for granted, but it, let's live it out for our sake and for the sake of this world. Amen. So we're continuing our series today, um, which is Stained Glass Stories. We're looking at the stained glass from our sanctuary. And, and as I've said, my, my hope in this series is not that we would remember what it means to be at church, but we would be uh, we'd embrace our calling to be the church, that these stories, we would embrace those and share those stories. We would be the church by sharing and living out these stories for the sake of this world. Uh, the story we're looking at today is uh, Jesus' feeding of the 5,000. Now, the Scottish um, essayist, Thomas Carlyle, he once said, men are like the, God they, uh, men are like the gods they serve. And you know what? I think he's right. Men are like the gods they serve. And, and the question really is, um, what is the God like that you serve? Now, presumably, most of you here probably are Christians. Some of you um, might have just logged on uh, exploring, right? Checking it out, checking out who is this Jesus guy. And, and I'm so grateful you're here. And I, and I pray by, with your, um, that your time spent with us today will reveal a more, a more clear picture of who Jesus is. Uh, but for those of us who, who are Christians, um, what is Jesus like? Who is this Jesus. Now we know the right answer to that question, right? Uh, Jesus is, he's loving, forgiving, gracious, merciful. He's all powerful. He can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask for or hope for and more. We know the right answers to what is Jesus like. But today I want you to, to give the honest answer to the question, what is Jesus like? Because men are like the gods they serve, so what is Jesus like? And I want you to give the honest answer. And the way to figure out what, the, what that honest answer is, is to answer this question, how do you live your life? How do you find yourself praying? How do you live out your faith? How we do those things reveal who Jesus is, who Jesus really is to us. Is he, is he the Lord, God, King, Savior, Friend revealed in this word, or is he a, a God of our own making? Men are like the gods they serve. What is Jesus like? Let's read our text for today, and we'll get back to that. Uh, but our text for today is John chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed uh, the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy enough bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 
Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Or here is a boy with five, excuse me, five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. So at this point, up to this point now, in the, as you put the Gospels together, up to this point, the disciples had heard and experienced these things. Jesus had proclaimed to be God. They had seen Jesus turn water into wine. Uh, they've seen him heal the sick, the leprous, and the paralyzed. They've seen him calm the storm. Uh, they've seen him open the eyes of the blind and the mouth of the mute. Uh, they've seen him cast out demons, and they've even seen him raise the dead. This is what they've seen up to this point. Uh, and I don't mean to be glib here, but that's a pretty impressive resume. So now here we are, 5,000 people. The text says 5,000 men, uh, but we can assume there's more, right? Because more than likely, there weren't just men there. Women and children would have been there too. So there's more than 5,000 people. But let's just say for numbers, 5,000 people are here and they're hungry. 5,000 people have growling stomachs. And Mark tells us in his account of this uh, that Jesus has compassion on them, right? He reveals the heart of Jesus, that Jesus has compassion on the hungry. And so Jesus asks this question. He asks this question in verse 5. He says to Philip, uh, and he, again, presumably um, to all the disciples, right? But to Philip, since Philip is from this region, he says, where shall we buy enough bread for these people to eat? Wow. <laughs> are you kidding? Where are we going to get enough bread I mean, <laughs> to feed 5,000 people? I can't imagine that. And that's Philip's response. Look what he says in verse 7. Eight months wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. <laughs> I get where, where Philip is coming from. I really do because what's Jesus thinking here? Right? What's his doing? What is he doing? What's his mindset? I mean, what he is asking here is the impossible. I, I really do get Philip's, uh, Philip's response. I really do. Because Jesus is always asking the impossible. Are you kidding? I mean, that's, that's what Philip says here, essentially. What? Are you kidding? It can't be done. Like in our, in our, uh, during this crisis, what are you kidding? I can't find toilet paper for 5,000 people. I can't find Clorox wipes, right? Jesus, what you're asking here is the impossible. And that's what Jesus always seems to do, right? Is ask the impossible, ask us to do these impossible things, to carry out these, these daunting tasks, these unreasonable requests that he has. Forgive the one who hurt me, Jesus? Are you kidding? Do you know the pain? And the anguish they've caused? What, serve others? Really really help others in need? Yeah, I get it, Jesus, but are you kidding? I, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm busy. I've got things I've got to get done. There, there's things I have to do. I don't have time to do this, Jesus. Give or, or, or continue my offering or maybe even start giving an offering? <laughs> really, Jesus? Don't you understand how, how understand how precarious my job situation is right now? I mean, don't you get that that my retirement savings isn't what it should be? I don't even know what the future is going to hold, Jesus. So uh, give or put others' needs ahead of my own. <laughs> Why? Because if I do that, who's going to meet my needs? I mean, who's looking out for me, Jesus? Why should I put somebody else's needs above my own? Jesus is always asking, it seems, the impossible. Feed 5,000 people. How's this going to happen? You know, I think Carlisle was, was right on the nose when he said, men are like the gods they serve. Right? And what he means by that is we, we, are, we are like, we conduct our lives. We live out our faith based on, on the God we serve, or rather the concept of the God that we serve. For instance, think back to, to David when David beat Goliath. Now, there's another part to that story. David beat Goliath for sure, 
But before that happens, King Saul and the army of Israel, they, they were cowering before, before Goliath. They, they, the army, Saul and the army, came before Goliath, and what they do? They ran in fear, right? They were living out their faith. They were, they were, they were trying to defeat Goliath based on a deficient concept of God. They were like the God they served. And guess what? The God they served, in their minds, couldn't defeat Goliath. Therefore, they couldn't either. And so they ran and they hid and they cowered in fear. But David was different. David was like the God he served because his God, his God was a God of might. His God was the God of the heavenly hosts. His God would defeat Goliath. In fact, let's take a look at that story. Let's take a look. It's a, if you want to go with me, it's a 1 Samuel uh, 17. And we're just going to hit a, hit a couple verses here. Uh, first of all, verse 26. So the Israelites are cowering in fear because of Goliath. And 26, David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine? That's Goliath. And removes this disgrace from Israel. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And then verse 36, David says, Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. And then here, skipping over to verse uh, 45 through 47, David said to Goliath, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the, give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Wow. You see the difference? The, the army of Israel, Saul, they're cowering in fear because their concept of God is that God can't defeat him. David's concept of God is the biblical truth re, uh, of God revealed. He understands, he gets who God is, and he defeats Goliath. Why? Because he knows God will defeat him. David understands that. David is like the God he serves and Goliath is defeated. Saul and the army of Israel are like the gods they serve and they are defeated. And this takes us back to our text. Philip and the disciples are like Saul and the army of Israel. Right? They have a deficient concept of God, of who Jesus is. They're basing on what they think, what they feel. It's a deficient concept of him. And so when Jesus says hey, let's feed 5,000 people. They're like, well, it can't be done. Th th this can't happen. You can't feed 5,000 people, right? They are already defeated. They know it can't be done. And so they say, hey, Jesus, nice sentiment. We get it, but it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> We're not gonna be able to feed 5,000 people. And they're defeated, right? Because they don't have... They're like the God they, they serve. They're deficient God, not like the God that they have seen. They're not like what they have seen already from Jesus. They are not like the one who has calmed the storm and raised the dead. They're based on their own concept, not who Jesus has revealed himself to be. And you know, and the same is true for us. Forgive when I've been hurt so badly. Help right? Help others when they need it and not when it fits into my schedule. Give, even if I don't know what the future holds. Put others' needs ahead of my own. I mean, Jesus, I mean, those are nice sentiments. They are, but it ain't going to happen, right? Because I, I, I can't do that, Jesus. Isn't that where we end up oftentimes? Because we have a deficient concept, because we're not, we're not basing our decisions, our, our ability to, to do those things based on who Jesus has revealed himself to be. We're basing it on, well, on our concept of who Jesus is. And when we do that, guess what? Like the army of Israel, we live in fear. Like, like Philip and the disciples, we become skeptics. We become distrusting. We become uh, selfish and self-centered. We become defeated. And guess what else? We become, believe it or not, hard of hearing. <laughs> I know you're thinking, what? 
Go with me back to verse 5 in John. John chapter 6, verse 5. And look what Jesus says. He says, where shall we buy enough food for these people to eat? Did you catch the key word there? Let me read it one more time. Where shall we buy enough bread for these people to eat? We. Jesus doesn't say to Philip or the disciples, hey, go feed these, these 5,000 people. He says, we. Where will, where will we do this? See, Philip didn't hear that because Philip was just lost in his own concept of, of what is possible and impossible based on his own understanding. Feeding 5,000 people, to Philip, that was impossible. He didn't hear Jesus say, we, Jesus, who is the living Son of God. Jesus, the one who, who calmed the storm, who, tr- who turned water into wine, who healed the sick, who raised the dead. Philip didn't hear Jesus say, we, we, Philip, we will do this. And so Philip was like, this can't be done. We can't do it. And how often is that true for us? How often do you find that true in your own life? That you're carrying around this deficient concept of who Jesus is. It's based on your thoughts and your feelings, not the truth revealed to us in God's word. Not based on who Jesus really has revealed himself to be. Because who Jesus has revealed himself to be is our Savior. And what Jesus has done is he has forgiven us our sins. And because he has done that, he has made us new. As we said earlier, we are new. New creations in Christ. And Christ is in us. Now, today, this is our reality that we are living as Christians now today. New creations, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. This is the good news that we have. So the, the truth that, that whatever Jesus asks us to do, right? So whatever he asks us to do, no matter how impossible it may seem or how unreasonable it sounds, the truth is because Jesus is in us, we do this together. We do this with him. Just like he said to Philip, where will we buy enough bread? So he says the same thing to us. How will we? Where will we? This is the reality we live. And so that means this, right? Forgive? I can't, but Christ in me can. Serve others? I can't, but Christ in me can. Give? Continue to give? Even if I don't know the future? I can't, but Christ in me can. Put others' needs ahead of my own? (laughs) I can't. But Christ in me can. You see see what's going on here? And, and, And there's more. It goes on. I can make it through the storm because the God I serve, right, has calmed the storm. I can forgive others because the God I serve has forgiven everything in me already. I can give And I can give generously because the God I serve has already given generously. I can face all things in this world. I can face even death because the God I serve has already conquered death. As Carlisle said, men are like the gods they serve. Are we like the God? Are we like Jesus whom we serve? The Jesus revealed to us in scripture. The Jesus who has calmed the storm, has turned water to wine, has fed the 5,000, has cast out demons, has raised uh, the dead, and has even risen from the dead himself. Are we like the God we serve? Are we like Jesus revealed to us in the Bible? Or are we settling for a deficient concept of him? Are we living and cowering in fear, just as uh, King Saul and the army of Israel were? Are we, are we moaning and groaning, groaning as Philip did, like, oh, this is impossible, are we saying, the God I serve, together we can do this. Listen, when we live out our faith, when we live out our faith based on the truth of who Jesus really is, not on our own concept of him, 
but on who Jesus really is, then we will find that the impossible, as Jesus said, becomes possible. We'll find those hard, unreasonable tasks become opportunities to reveal God's glory. We'll find that we can do all that he asks us to do, even feeding 5,000. So this is my prayer for you. I, I, my prayer for you, for me, make this your prayer today, this week. Make this your prayer going forward in your faith walk. And, it, and it, it's this, that no matter how impossible the task is that Jesus is asking you to do, no matter how hard it may seem, no matter how high that mountain may be or how low that valley is, no matter how unreasonable the task may be that Jesus sets before you, he's asking you to do, Let this be your prayer based on the truth revealed to us in Scripture. Let this be your prayer. Okay, Jesus, when do we start? When do we start? Men are like the gods they serve. May we be like the God, Jesus Christ, revealed to us in Scripture, whom we serve. And that's probably enough for today. I want to give out points. Sorry if I uh, forgot to do that earlier. Uh, I want to give out points for those who brought your your Bible today with you and had it open. Um, Let's see. Let's give out 1,500 points today. Oh, wait. 5,000 people. Ah, 5,000 points. If Jesus fed fed 5,000 people, uh, we can give out 5,000 points. You get 5,000 points if you brought your, your Bible today. So we're going to continue with communion now. Uh, Hopefully you have the elements there and ready. If not, this would be the time to get them. As you are going to get those or setting up, I want to remind you to be sure to speak a blessing over any children or anybody else uh, in your household with you today uh, who's not going to receive communion. Be sure to to speak a blessing over them, letting them know uh, that God loves them, that they are dear to his heart, uh, that they are his child as well. So we continue now with the the words of institution. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to the disciples. And he said, take and drink all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We pray now together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Take eat. This is my body. Take drink. This is my blood. And now may the peace of Christ, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Depart in peace. Well, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I hope you have an awesome day. Remember, remember the God you serve is Jesus, the living Son of God. And with him, all things are possible. Let this be your prayer. Okay, Jesus. When do we start? Have a great day. We'll see you next time.